Every project should start out with a clear, well thought out plan, as I have done here. I've had these boards sitting around for like 10 years. They were leftovers from some previous project, which means they weren't my first choice then, and they certainly aren't now. But at some point, it's use it or lose it. My wife put in a work order for a floating shelf above the desk I built for us recently, which is a video on my channel, check it out. I figured these boards would work well enough for the application. Oh, and by the way, I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to the new y I mean, the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to build and install a beautiful floating shelf. I'm using an Abbey Normal milling process for this project. I'm not doing any face jointing. All these boards are too warped to try and flatten. So instead, I'm getting one edge as straight as I can, then I'm creating a parallel edge with bandsaw, then I follow that up by planing to thickness. So here are the parts so far, an end piece, a top bottom, and a front. I've done what I can to use the best part of each board. If there was ever a question of who has the best dad jokes on YouTube, I'd like to point out my shirt, which should wash away any doubts you may have. A planer does not flatten wood, it only creates parallel faces, and this shot demonstrates that. The joinery for this shelf is simply going to be glued up bevel joints. Cutting bevel joints at the table saw is challenging, especially when the boards are like me, warped and twisted. Fortunately, I have a super secret weapon, the mighty power feeder. The benefit of using the power feeder isn't really the fact that it pushes the stock by the cutter, but more that it applies a strong, consistent downward pressure. At this point, my hope is that it has enough force to press flat the work pieces so the bevels come out nice and straight. My plan was to try this first, and if it didn't work, I was going to clamp the work pieces to my bench and use a router and a chamfer bit to cut the bevels. I like to use a 24 tooth rip blade for this process. Because of the 45 degree bevel, the saw is cutting through much more wood than it would be at 90 degrees. Pythagoras explains this better than I could. So a blade with fewer teeth will give a better cut. I set the blade a little past 45 degrees to ensure that the outside of the joint has the best chance to close up nice and tight. I cut the bevels in three passes. The first is just to knock some material off and get it out of the way. This is a good time to make sure the power feeder is set up correctly. I cut the second just shy of where I want it to be. I do this so that I can test fit and make sure the cuts are coming out the way that I want them to. The third pass is set up so that it leaves a nice sharp point. Since the three long pieces are just shy of eight feet long, I have two options to cut the ends. Cut them at the miter saw or the sliding table saw. Either would work, but the slider does a more accurate job. Note the backer piece to prevent blowout. To clamp everything together, I'm going to use blue tape. I've made a ton of shelves this way over the years. I haven't made one with lumber this out of flat. So up to this point, I've been hoping these pieces would straighten each other out when folded together. I was also a little concerned that the blue tape wouldn't hold. Even with these sizable gaps, I folded the pieces together and to my surprise, the joints closed up beautifully. This really is a great demonstration of the majesty of blue tape. Hey 
After the test fold, I was feeling pretty good. So I said fornicate it and I jumped right on to the glue up. I taped the end piece on and then flipped the assembly over and I noticed it had some twist. I clamped it to my bench so that I can dry in as straight of a position as possible. Here are a couple close-ups of the clamped up joints. Not too bad if I do say so myself. I let it dry for two days, not because it needed it, but because I needed to head out of town on my annual fall slash birthday motorcycle trip. When I got back, I was feeling relaxed and ready to have some fun in the shop, so I thought I'd play the old basketball trash can ball of tape game. Normally this takes like 15 tries, not today, nailed on the first shot. Shut up. After the glorious tape ball shot, I wanted to clean up all the surfaces and remove the glue just to make sure that the joints had remained tight. Again, to my surprise, everything looked great. My next move was to trim off the excess. And let me tell you something, that is some D minus work with the handsaw. No problem though, I cleaned up the leftovers with a block plane. Song recommendation for this video, Intergalactic by the Beastie Boys. The song still sounds awesome 23 years later. The robot with the old school dance moves, still awesome. So yeah, anyway, Intergalactic, give it a spin as the kids would say. The shelf is pretty much done at this point. Now it's time to make the French cleat that will hold the shelf to the wall. Normally I cut this angle a little steeper, but the table adjustment handle on my bandsaw broke, so I was stuck with this angle for a few days until I fixed it. Anyway, the thin piece gets glued to the shelf, the other piece gets mounted to the wall. Time for pro tip, I like to hold the cleat back from the edge just a little. I do this to make scribing the shelf to the wall easier. The cleat gets glued and clamped with a bunch of spring clamps. I don't know why I left these in. I used them during glue up to make sure I had folded the parts the correct amount. For some reason, the world just seemed like a better place if I left them in there. A quick modification needs to be made to the wall portion of the cleat. As is, the shelf won't slide onto the cleat, so I need to make a relief cut. I could just cut the cleat down a little, but I like to make them fit fairly tight so that the shelf can be attached to the cleat from the top or the bottom. This allows for some flexibility during installation. With the corner knocked off, the shelf will now slide onto the cleat. As you can see, a screw or nail from the top or the bottom will lock the shelf to the cleat. Getting close, the cleat's ready to go. Just a couple small details before installation. I'd like to point out, and this may seem obvious, but I try to orient parts so that defects are in the least visible position. Since the shelf will be mounted above eye level, the board with a couple knots will be the top. This line represents the outside face of the cleat. I drill a few pilot holes and I bias them toward this line as well as angle the drill a few degrees. I do this so that my drill won't bump and scuff my freshly painted flat sheen walls during installation. Hallelujah. 
I'm going to use two screws for this project. The larger screw is two and a half inches and has a combination Phillips or number two square drive. This will hold the cleat to the wall. The smaller screw is known as a trim head screw. The head of the screw is just larger than a finish nail. It's driven in with a number one square drive, and these are great for door molding installation, or in this case, floating shelf installation. In the office, I use the desk I built as scaffolding because I know it's strong enough to support my ample and hefty body weight. I mark the studs with magnets. These are great because they're super cheap and they don't mark up the wall. Once the studs are marked, I draw a level line that I will use to mount the cleat. Have you ever asked yourself, how long of a screw should I use? Well, I think it's a good idea to calculate screw length so it only penetrates the wall stud one inch. With few exceptions, this should prevent the screw from hitting the other trades that could be run through the wall. So I have a one inch cleat, half inch drywall, hence I'm using a two and a half inch screw. And just like that, the shelf is in place. With the shallow angle of the cleat, I'm slow to build trust that the shelf won't fall off the wall. The walls in this room aren't too bad, but I still like to do a little scribing. To me, nothing screams good carpentry more than when something is nicely scribed. I use a compass-like thingy set to the width of the largest gap. I draw a line all the way around. The blue tape is there to keep the walls clean. Since this is a personal project, I get to do this part in my shop versus the job site. The key to scribing is good marking. Once that's done, it's a simple matter of removing material down to the marked line. I like to use a powered plane for the bulk of the removal. Then I switch to a spoke shave for the dips and bumps and lumps that the plane can't get into. A coarse grit belt sander or a sharp block plane work well for this also. A small back bevel makes sneaking up to the line easier. One final test fit just to make sure the fit is tight like a tiger. After that, some sanding to remove pencil lines and smudges. I also ease the sharp edges. Finally, a couple coats of polyurethane to match the finish on the desktop. One last time, the shelf goes on the cleat. I drive in the trim head screws mentioned earlier to lock the shelf in place. For the closing shots of this video, I took the liberty to decorate this shelf with things that I find important. So we'll see how long that lasts. I think the shelf looks pretty cool and it fills out the wall nicely. We debated two thinner shelves. I think that would have looked crowded. I'm also quite pleased with how well the joints came out considering the lumber I was working with. How do you think I did? I'd love to hear from you. Put your questions, comments, fears, or concerns in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Till next time.